A beloved classic and one of the best Resident Evil games to date, Resident Evil 4, a game that spans multiple generations and numerous consoles, considered by many one of the best games ever made in fact. But the beloved horror game had a deep history of constantly changing, this leading it to have four prior builds before coming to what we know, two of which even spun off into their own games and all leading into drama around a failed GameCube exclusivity deal. A phase that sets it so far apart from the final game that many even call it Resident Evil 3.5. And so, in this special, we shall look back on the history and beta unused content of Resident Evil 4. Following the near end of Resident Evil 2's development in late 1997, plans were in place to make several new Resident Evil games. One being branded as a true sequel, featuring Claire Redfield, one of the two protagonists of Resident Evil 2. The other being a spin-off entry called Resident Evil 1.9, featuring Jill Valentine of Resident Evil 1. But in addition, another Resident Evil was planned to portray the soldier Hunk from the fourth survival scenario of Resident Evil 2 on a cruise ship as an alternate sequel to Resident Evil 2. All planned for the PlayStation 1, except for the true sequel that was being made for the Dreamcast. But there was one problem. Sony had bartered for the limited rights of the Resident Evil 3 name for its own console already. This posed a problem for Capcom, as the true sequel, which was being made for the Sega Dreamcast, couldn't be called that. At that point, the alternate sequel was to be given that title instead, while the Dreamcast game was now simply titled as Resident Evil Code Veronica. The game was to take place this time on a cruise ship with Hunk, being caught in a viral outbreak while on a mission to retrieve the G-Virus. This setting was being made as a means to keep the series fresh after exploring a mansion and the city as its setting. However, by mid-1998, the Sony PlayStation 2 was revealed. This put pressure on Capcom on the idea of releasing this alternate sequel so close to the PlayStation 2's launch due to how far behind it was in development, as it could kill its sales. As such, the series creator and producer Shinji Mikami was tasked with pushing the game to the PlayStation 2. Hideki Kamiya, who was the director of this alternate sequel and also the director of Resident Evil 2, followed suit with this push to the next generation hardware. However, instead of continuing the same story, it was scrapped altogether as Hideki Kamiya wished to start over with the idea of utilizing the PlayStation 2's hardware for the story of this Resident Evil 3 game. But with this game restarting development as of mid-1998, it would mean that it could take a while for a main entry to hit the market. As a result, Capcom instead rebranded Resident Evil 1.9 as Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. And so the brainchild of Hideki Kamiya was now officially going to be called Resident Evil 4. The new Resident Evil 4 was officially announced to exist to the public by Shinji Mikami in December of 1999, along with its development for the PlayStation 2. The team started to plan out the potential of this new game. With Code Veronica's story already somewhat exploring the inner workings of the Umbrella Corporation, the company that had plagued the cast in the series up to then, an idea was being made to further expand on it by directly tackling the family that runs the company, the Spencers. The story was being penned by Noboru Sugimura, who wrote the critically acclaimed Resident Evil 2, and it featured a story that involved the protagonist Tony Redgraves, a police officer who was seemingly an invincible man with superhuman strength and intellect. All of which was attained due to the progenitor virus by Umbrella's biotechnology, a virus believed to be millions if not billions of years old. The story would involve Tony uncovering the mysteries of his character that would lead him to Malay Island, the home of the Umbrella facility. This would eventually lead into the revelation of Tony being the son of Oswell E. Spencer the founder of Umbrella, as well as a plotline featuring Tony's twin brother, Paul Redgraves. The major catch for all this, however, was that Hideki Kamiya wanted Tony and the game to be a cool and stylish action game instead. The departure went as far as to get rid of the fixed camera angles and the pre-rendered backgrounds that the series had been known for, as it just would not look cool enough for Tony Redgraves on screen. In fact, he was designed to have a strong appearance dressed in red and black and employed a heroic look with his trench coat. 
top that off with not only wielding regular firearms, but also demonic weapons. All in an attempt to make the player feel even cooler when wielding them against the enemy. For inspiration, the team visited Europe to study Gothic architecture through Spade, England, and Welsh castles. All in order to build the maps of the game. Of course, the team soon took notice of how much of a departure this was from regular Resident Evil convention. This even included series producer Shinji Mikami, who felt it had strayed too far off course from being a survival horror game. Eventually, Mikami convinced the staff and Hideki Kamiya to make this into a brand new franchise instead. And so this version of Resident Evil 4 was now rebranded as Devil May Cry. With the game now being its own series, Tony Redgraves became Dante, who is now written as a half-demon and was incredibly strong and invincible due to his demonic powers. And seemingly, Paul Redgraves became Virgil, or in this case, Nilo Angelo. The rest of the cast stayed the same, save for some redesigns, especially the female lead Trish, who had many designs from rather refined to something a lot closer to the final DMC design. Meanwhile, Dante's parents and any plots around the Umbrella Corporation were written out entirely for a more demonic story about the Sons of Sparta. With that, many of the enemies that did appear in the build also did appear in Devil May Cry, but prior to that, they had many ties to the Resident Evil mythos too, such as the Blades, which were to be a Hunter variant, this cut G-Crow that was to be a G-Virus infected crow, and the undead humans, as with series tradition, except even more monstrous. Many of the others were cut altogether. And so, with Resident Evil 4 becoming Devil May Cry, development had to restart again in 2001, this time with designer Hiroshi Shibata taking the director chair. Despite Sugimura's story becoming Devil May Cry, he was brought back to write the story of Resident Evil 4 again, and this time, one that was much more in line with previous entries. However, Sugimura kept a lot of the major plot points from that take, including the Spencer Castle and the Progenitor Virus, the protagonist this time being the return of the Resident Evil 2 protagonist, Leon S. Kennedy, who had since been conscripted into the US Army, and specifically within an elite anti-Umbrella team participating in raiding the Spencer Castle, where Umbrella's headquarters are located. The operation, however, goes in the wrong direction as the team encounters a new B.O.W. called the Black Fog. Surprisingly not made by Umbrella, but by their competition, HCF, which is run by the serious antagonist, Albert Wesker, as a means of an attack on Umbrella, and with this anti-Umbrella team getting caught up in their feud. Leon in this process is the one sole survivor, but gets infected with a retrovirus. As such, Leon's battle is to survive and resist mutation while exploring the castle. In his exploration, many of Umbrella's secrets are revealed, amongst which is Leon finding a girl who was being experimented on and protected by a B.O.W. dog she could control and would end up joining as a second playable character. Along with those, Further secrets are explored, including the remains of an ancient underground civilization where the progenitor virus is isolated within its superhuman king. This all pointing to how Umbrella was just a cover for Oswald Spencer as an attempt to utilize the progenitor virus to achieve immortality. The Leon of this build looks quite evolved from his Resident Evil 2 build by sporting his famous leather coat and black clothing, looking very similar to his final take but at this point, his coat had a rather distinct puffy collar as opposed to the final games. In addition, it appears further remnants of Kamiya's stylish build did stay here, as the use of 3D backgrounds as opposed to pre-rendered ones were now a mainstay. While the game was initially being built to be ported to other consoles down the road, Shinji Mikami had plans to make this game a Nintendo GameCube exclusive. Mikami's view on the PlayStation 2 at the time were that Sony was focusing less and less on gaming due to the incorporation of the DVD functionality. As such, Mikami wished to support Nintendo as they not only were making a gaming-only machine, but even using proprietary mini-discs, the opposite of regular video DVDs. With development shifting to the GameCube, developers were entering unfamiliar ground and had a tough time as a result. Nintendo did, however, assist them in learning the development tools, 
something that bolstered Mikami's support for the company. Concurrently, the old cancel Resident Evil 0 from the 64 disk drive and a remake of Resident Evil 1 were being made for the GameCube. The remake specifically became grounds to test game assets from Resident Evil 4 on. Eventually, on September 13, 2001, Shinji Mikami held a press conference where he announced that the Resident Evil Numbered series was now to be made exclusive to the GameCube with ports of Resident Evil 2, 3, and Code Veronica to follow. With such a strong tie to Nintendo now, Capcom doubled down on Mikami's push for the GameCube support by announcing the Capcom 5 deal. This was a deal that would make 5 Capcom games exclusive to the GameCube. In addition to Resident Evil 4, these included Beautiful Joe, Dead Phoenix, PNO3, and Killer7. In fact, Shinji Mikami was so confident about keeping the series exclusive to the GameCube that in an interview in 2002, he literally stated that Resident Evil 4 will definitely release only on the GameCube. If it comes out to another console, I will cut my head off. But as the team continued with developing what many dub as the castle build, problems were coming up with the star of the game, the Black Fog enemy. Being that it was a mass of floating tentacles, it was too much for the GameCube to handle. In a scramble to find a workaround, they devised to change the story entirely once again, this time to one featuring Leon entering hallucinations and encountering enemies through a side effect of his mutation. This would lead into the next build of the game, Hallucination. And if you've been enjoying this video so far, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to further support us and keep creating new videos. The castle build was now being scrapped with the script in fact being given to another Capcom production team that utilized it to make the game called Haunting Ground, a spin-off entry of the Clock Tower series, the second game that spawned from Resident Evil 4's development. In place of Sugimura, Resident Evil 3's writer Yasuhisa Kawamura stepped in to write the next take of this game, with inspiration taken from the film Lost Souls which featured hallucination upon entering a restroom and having the room change drastically, hallucinations were to take the place of the Black Fog B.O.W. this time around. In this case, much like the previous build, Leon was still infected with a virus, but the effects are what lead to Leon seeing the hallucination. With these early story ideas in mind, 2003 kicked off with the hallucination build. The story would still appear to take place in a castle-like structure, which may be the Spencer estate. During exploration, hallucinations would suddenly spring up, which would tint the room in a blue fog, an inspiration taken from John Carpenter's The Fog. In the state of hallucination, the room would warp and lead to monsters and paranormal beings to be seen and encountered. These include everything from killer dolls, a knight with an axe, and even a ghost with a hooked arm, which popularly has given this the fan name of Hookman. The interesting part is that this build used the traditional fixed camera angles when simply exploring, but switched to an over-the-shoulder angle when aiming your gun. However, another round of technical problems came up with this build. In order to quickly switch between a regular room and a hallucinated version of the room, as both were in fact two separately designed rooms, both had to be loaded at once. This was made with the idea of using up all of the GameCube's RAM. But what wasn't factored in were the enemies. At most, they were able to load in only one enemy, something the demo alone showed far more of. Therefore, this was another build that had to be scrapped by late 2003. With many of these fresh ideas failing for either being too technically demanding or outright different, the team started to look back to the past, back to using zombies again. Up to this point, zombies were nowhere to be seen, as it was just purely wild B.O.W.s or even ghosts. But this was an idea that Shinji Mikami despised. He felt that zombies were becoming too boring for the established fanbase at this point. And you know what? He may have been right. During development up to then, the Resident Evil 1 remake was released on the GameCube and met with critical success, but commercially, it was an absolute failure becoming the worst-selling game in the franchise to date. Matters only grew worse as Resident Evil Zero sold even worse. While some may blame the exclusivity to the GameCube, a console with a small install base as a reason, to Shinji Mikami, this was evidence enough that the series was growing stagnant and losing its audience due to the repetition of zombies. This as such led to Shinji Mikami once again hitting the brakes and restarting development. While not much more is known about the build, 
There was one crucial enemy made for this build that would impact development later, called the Daba Man, which was in fact a non-zombie human enemy. Daba, which means pack horse, which might have meant that these humans were carrying something, whether it be a virus or maybe even a parasite, something that is sinister. With Shinji Mikami back to the idea of reinventing the series, it became a welcome change to much of the staff who also had felt the series was getting too stagnant. As the game producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi stated, the game was stuck in a cookie cutter mold with shackles holding us down. In only three weeks, Mikami wrote the story himself, removing the focus from Umbrella this time and bringing more of an action focus to the series while making the camera entirely over the shoulder. While many were glad, some staff members weren't thrilled about the series changing so much. While Leon was kept from the previous builds, the other element that was brought over were the human elements from the zombie build called the Daba Man, or now known as the Ganados. Ganado translates to livestock, a meaning that follows a similar allusion to Daba, which means pack horse in this context. In this case, both were potentially referenced as the carrier of something, such as a parasite that would be eating them alive. The parasite, called La Plaga, is a virus developed by the new organization of the game Los Illuminado, a company that wasn't Umbrella for a change and a clear departure from the normal viral infections of the series. Even so, the human enemy still would be very aggressive much like zombies, but the major difference being that they would still retain their human intelligence, leading them to work collectively, use weapons, and even be able to dodge and run. On top of that, there are a lot more of them at once in comparison to any zombie horde prior, but that one may be more attributed to the power of the next generation consoles. The earliest iteration of them might have been these parasite humans, looking very zombie-like, but still called humans here. This may in fact even be a carryover from the zombie build that they had called the Daba Man, and apparently it was going to have some very wild mutations at that, reminding one of the mutations that William Birkin faced in Resident Evil 2 when infected with the G-Virus. Everything from multiple eyes and random spots of the body, to heavy tentacles, bulky bodies, and even an insectoid design on the bottom with the human on top. A female variant also existed with four pieces of art available, starting with a regular human, but followed by three mutations that included one with a giant bone arm, to an armless design with a massively dangerous mouth, and even a twin-headed version with four arms. These designs might have been inspired by the transformations of Lisa Trevor in the Resident Evil 1 remake, with how similar the mutations are, showcasing how both the male and female variety may have been a throwback to such mutations. Eventually though, the modern Ganado designs were made that looked far more human and nowhere near as grotesque or deformed. However, the modern Ganados themselves even had many designs that were considered but ultimately rejected, many which were rather out of this world. First is the beta version of the Garador enemies, which in fact were two different enemies at first. One is an armored Ganado, which had both a slimmer and a bulkier design, and complete with the Los Illuminados insignia. The other being the Assassin Bear Clawman, a shirtless Ganado featuring long claws of the final Garador enemy. A rather insane one is the one called the Super Dynamite Man, a Ganado strapped with many explosives that would rush in for a kamikaze attack with Leon. Another is the Arcanist, an enemy with two designs, both featuring three heads, but one with a black robe and the other with a white one, the white robed one appearing to have a tentacle capable of spraying gas. Next are a pair of Arabic styled ones, one featuring a rugged male with a turban called the Bound Slave, and the other a female one with a veil, tight clothes, and a tentacle coming from her right arm. Then we have this harlequin looking Ganado, another female and this one with a Flamberg sword. But moving on to the zealot variety of the Ganados, there are also some female zealots in Literally Planned 2, featuring an elaborate mask that covered their face. This followed by the mouth hidden zealot that also appeared to be another cut female variety, carrying a scythe like many of the lower level zealots from the final game. Now what is interesting is that a higher level cultist such as this one here was even planned to have a scythe too. A tattooed variety was also planned, whereby they had their arms exposed, but with the insignias tattooed all over it. A showcase of their devotion. This one however weared a bovine skull instead of the typical ram skull that the other higher ranking zealots do. 
And then there is one higher ranking zealot who would be wielding a torch. Now aside from Ganados, other enemies were being planned too, all of course in some ways incorporating the Lost Plaga Parasite. One such enemy is the Regenerators, which were designed as a B.O.W. of the Los Illuminato cult, featuring many Plaga Parasites. As the name suggests, these enemies were ones that would regenerate continuously until all the Parasites were killed using the infrared scope. These were designed as a means to truly keep the survival horror mechanic of the series alive. However, the Regenerator had a prototype that were heavily shapeshifters too called the Lurching Man, looking a lot bulkier than their final counterpart. Related to another B.O.W. looking enemy is one called the Electric Man. Based on the name alone, it might have been one that would grab Leon and electrocute him dead. Might even have been another variation of the Regenerator, much as the Iron Maidens were. But aside from the enemies, Leon himself at this point had come a fair ways with his coat, now being changed up to have no fur on the outside collar. The more interesting bit comes from the new female character, Ashley Graham. Ashley being a character now introduced as a plot point of the story, the president's daughter who had been kidnapped with Leon now instead of being tasked to investigate Umbrella is being sent to locate and rescue her. Technically, this was considered evolution to the girl that Leon found that was a test subject back in the castle build of the game that was set to be a second playable character who would have a B.O.W. dog that would follow her orders. This concept stayed all the way till the zombie build until rewritten as the president's daughter. However, the modern Ashley originally also had a different design, wearing a coat, leggings, and a checkered scarf before being redesigned to have an orange sleeveless turtleneck shirt, a plaid skirt, and a sweater draped over her neck. With Shinji Mikami being the longtime creator of the series, and now the director of Resident Evil 4, the team wished to include an homage for him in the game. This came in the form of a special watch that they wished to include due to his love of watches. And so within an internal demo that the team made, this watch made it in and eventually was removed altogether in the final game. The demo itself however was never made public, but over time found its way into the hands of few people in this day and age. But in terms of public demos, two more were at least released. The first of which being the Japanese trial disc from September of 2004, which contained a few differences. The first of which being that the bonfire scene in the main village wasn't there. But the more interesting one is a painting of the iconic enemy, the Chainsaw Man. This painting depicted him without his mask on. The only time to be depicted as such before being removed altogether. Another demo was the North American preview disc from December of 2004. While released after, it was from an earlier build with some major differences. Most notably, the knife was in the briefcase that you need to equip rather than Leon having it on at all times. In addition within the demo build, the binoculars were an item that Leon could use at any point, much like the knife unlike the final game which switched to it only during certain cutscenes. But with the update to this version of Resident Evil 4, the over-the-shoulder perspective that Leon took when aiming was now the default for the whole game. Gone were the fixed cameras for good from the series, and in was the cameras staying permanently behind Leon. In addition, all ballistic weapons in the game now carried a laser pointer to better assist in aiming. Aiming which was in many ways one of the major weaknesses of this series prior to this. And it's not just a precise controls, but shooting enemies in certain locations had them even react differently too. But an even bigger addition was how ammo was now a lot more plentiful this time around, a trait that previously didn't exist to emphasize that survival aspect of survival horror. And all these items and weapons being stored within a now robust briefcase that you can piece together in a Tetris-like fashion. However, there were even a number of weapons and items planned that were cut at this stage too, the most famous being the silencer, two of them in fact, one being for the Red 9 and the Matilda handguns, and the other for the TMP. Both of these stayed in as usable items up to the Resident Evil 4 public beta, where with cheats, one can buy them from the merchant. It is also worth noting that Wesker in the mercenaries mode had the silencer equipped to his handgun by default. Another cut weapon is the homing mine darts. Darts meant for the mine thrower. If one uses the walk through wall cheat, it can even be found just outside of the map of the first area. The description for it is rather broken to indicating its unfinished state. 
A few cut miscellaneous items were also found within the data of the game too, one being the Onyx Stone, the other being the Amethyst Stone. Both of these having an unknown purpose and come in a large and small form, potentially might have been gems that you could sell for money. In addition, two unnamed stones were also found but didn't have a name yet associated with them. As the series progressed, the game's maps had gotten more expressive and grander. Resident Evil 4 was to take that even further, with environmental hazards and interactions on top of fully 3D environments, utilizing various test maps to work this system in and making it work, as well as various early maps that were very simple in design and textureless before going on to the final versions. This very map in fact being a very interesting one that even in its final state had an odd 2D cutout of a woman in the distance that you normally couldn't see. Whether that was a staff member or an in-staff joke is hard to describe. But there were even a few areas that were cut all together that looked somewhat complete. The game was bringing in a new version of the mercenaries from Resident Evil 3 here, whereby you could control one of various characters and collect points for each kill, much of which using existing maps from the game. However, one map that was cut all together was this one that looked to be a desert city, looking very unfinished with a lot of placeholder textures, rough polygons, and even a sign saying goal on it in Japanese. Potentially a very of the mercenaries where one had to reach a location. As development was trekking along strong in 2004, voice acting was well underway and with detailed care in representing the character's facial expressions to the tone of their voice actor. Even being shown at E3 2004 together with the GameCube's other killer apps including Metroid Prime 2 and Twilight Princess. Everything looking very clear and strong for what was a killer app for the GameCube. Or so it seemed, Resident Evil 4 will definitely release only on the GameCube. If it comes to another console, I will cut my head off. With less than 3 months left to launch, on October 31st, 2004, Capcom came forward with the sudden announcement of not only Resident Evil Dead Aim and Outbreak coming to the PlayStation 2, which never fell under the original deal, but as well a port of Resident Evil 4 in late 2005. It was a shock to many. Many felt that Capcom had practically shot any chance of it selling well on the GameCube since many would just wait for the PlayStation 2 version. However, Capcom cited that due to the strong demand from from Resident Evil fans and Capcom also wishing to maximize the audience of the series with new players, they wished to bring it to what was the best selling console in gaming yet. In fact, by then, the whole Capcom 5 deal that Capcom announced back in 2002, which would bring 5 games exclusively to the GameCube, was a failure. Dead Phoenix was cancelled, Beautiful Joe was already ported to the PS2, and only PN03 had stayed exclusive, but was a commercial failure. Killer7 was still on its way, but that was also going multi-platform with a PlayStation 2 port at launch. Despite Mikami's comments to 2002, he most definitely never cut his head off. He mainly stayed silent when all the this came out and in fact personally did go on to work on this port too. The PS2 version however was a challenge in itself. The version being made on the GameCube was considered cutting edge at the time with it taking full advantage of the GameCube's power. The PlayStation 2 was a more underpowered console next to it and several cutbacks had to be made including lowering the polygon count on virtually everything, removing various lighting effects, and even the water effects had to be changed to have no reflection. Top that off with all the cutscenes being made into pre-rendered video files, meaning that even if you were to have Leon and Ashley dressed differently, it would not be reflected in the cutscenes. However, to make up for this, Capcom decided to include several additions including new costumes, a true 16x9 mode as opposed to the GameCube's fake resolution, the PRL-412 which could one-shot enemies, only unlocked when beating on Professional, a 5-part documentary called Ada's Report, an amateur mode, and a movie browser. But biggest of all, a second short playable mode called Separate Ways that would follow the returning Resident Evil supporting character Ada Wong's perspective of the game. And at long last, the GameCube version of Resident Evil 4 released on January 11th, 2005. In addition to the regular version, it came in two collector editions, one that comes with a prologue art book and t-shirt, the other being a steel version exclusively from GameStop as the box states, but in addition comes with an art book, 
a Cell of Leon, and the soundtrack. As well, Capcom released a special chainsaw controller for the GameCube that one could buy off their websites for roughly $50, a controller that only made the game tougher to play. Following the GameCube release, the PlayStation 2 version was released a while later on October 25, 2005. Resident Evil 4 received universal praise for its story, gameplay, and characters, some even declaring it as the best game ever made. And even the PlayStation 2 port was loved and to many looked very very similar to the GameCube version despite the technical cutbacks that had to be made. And in fact, as Capcom expected, the PS2 version even did outsell the GameCube version in the end. 1.6 million units versus 2 million copies sold. And so after many many years of development, with some of the ideas turning into other games and some scrapped altogether, much of these ideas did snowball into a final game. From the process of having infected Leon, to the castle becoming a major part of the game, the game taking place in a remote location, and even Leon in the end becoming that tough but cool protagonist that Hideki Kamiya wanted for this entry originally too. And ironically, over time, the game even became the most ported Resident Evil game of all times, from a PC port, to a Wii port that introduced motion controls, a unique mobile edition, an HD version on the PS2 and 360, followed by a PS4 and Xbox One version, a newer PC version, an Oculus version with first person control, and lastly being able to play it portably on the Switch. Its legacy carried on with future entries taking on much of the influence from the over-the-shoulder gameplay while maintaining the horror themes of the series, whether for better or for worse. And eventually the game even sought getting a remake down the road, one that even brought back the beta designs of both Leon's fur jacket and Ashley's whole coat and black legging design. And once again, this revival became a massive hit and considered as one of the best entries in the series once more. While Resident Evil 4 still impacts the series with the rest of the series even taking on its playstyle, including the remakes, the impact of the series to gaming as a whole was phenomenal, and continues to be so to this day. In fact, even some of the cut ideas from the Spencer Mansion, the Progenitor Virus, and even the cut Desert City made their way into the series eventually by the ways of Resident Evil 5. But Resident Evil as a whole has a long history of troubled development and plans that never came about. Content that I plan to explore eventually, so hit the subscribe button for I'll plan to be back with more Resident Evil and other games cut content soon. Hit the like button and comment below on if you wished for any of the Resident Evil cut content to have made it in. So everyone, thank you for watching!